because if you are able to lay it out like this and, and state the business case in these terms and the time well spent, you're going to have a distinct advantage over your competitors. Smart Building video cast and podcast where we talk about all things smart controls. But what would a conversation be without my host and yours? The man, the myth, the legend, the one, the only Kenny Sinclair. That's right, folks. Ken Smyers is actually stranded in Mexico without internet connection. So Ken Sinclair has agreed to step in and be the co host this week. Ken, welcome to the show. Big dog. Thank you very much. Uh, those are big boots to, to fill for the uh, the Pittsburgh boy. Uh, glad that he's getting some sun, enjoying himself. Uh, lost in Mexico doesn't sound like such a bad idea. If you got to write tequila and you don't eat the worm, I think you're in pretty good shape. So uh, right, sounds good. Sounds good. Well, listen, Ken. Before we, you know, first of all, let's start. You got the August issue has hit the street. It's out. Tell our community about the theme. Building whispers. Uh, it's kind of, uh, I think you mentioned it in one of our last uh, uh, podcasts or control talks, I guess we should call them. And uh, it's been a good title. It's created some interest. Uh, we're find, seeing a little bit of interest in the uh, magazine. We're kind of crossing over from talking to uh, traditionally building automation propeller heads and starting to move over to a few IT pro, uh, propeller heads. The other thing we're starting to see is this whole social side of what it is we're doing, which uh, certainly something I don't know much about and I'm struggling with. Whoa, but uh, whoa, whoa, wait a second, man! You have more Twitter followers and more. I mean, you you are like the king of social media, man. So, but hey, real quick before before we we continue on, I want to give our community a little stable datum because those youngsters might not know where the reference the building whisperers come from, but, uh, but there was a movie back in the day where I think it was Robert Redford. And the deal was with Robert Redford, they would have these horses that couldn't be tamed or were sick or whatever, and they couldn't figure out what was wrong with them. And Robert Redford sort of had the ability to be in tune with them and could, you know, communicate with them. Right. And uh, so I, I think it's a, you know, it's a, it's a very apt sort of uh, reference, I think, to uh, building automations and, and sort of where we're going with this whole digital mindfulness thing. I think so too. I think it's that the, the touchy feely side of the building, as I keep saying, and uh, the empathy for the humanity that is inside of the building and the very purpose of the building. So uh, it does require us to dig a little deeper. In the final analysis, as always, we keep talking about all these new things, but in in the uh, in the end, we have to uh, we have to turn the temperature up or down, or close the window shade, and uh, we basically have to anticipate have empathy for what the people in the building want no exactly exactly now you know this whole thing about uh you know the humanization of the building if you will you know and and i'm getting sort of a lot of uh you know comments about well what do we do as a systems integrator what do we do and uh how do we do that Uh, but i think it's relevant i think the deal is that that you know we at control trends and you building automation controls we, we sort of track the trends and and the reason we keep bringing this up is, is this is unavoidable. This is going to happen. And like with every trend that comes about, being aware of it creates a great opportunity, even though we don't necessarily know how that's going to manifest just yet. Not being aware of it means you can be left out. I agree. I very much agree. And uh, when I first met Lawrence, that was, uh, was a connection for me of a, of a void in my life. Uh, I'm sure I've never, I've never been mindful this, and I, I think I still struggle to grasp the concepts. So I'm really looking forward to our guest. Oh, yeah. Well, I tell you, before we bring the guest on, Ken, one other thing I wanted to talk about is uh, you've sort of beefed the, lay, the lineup up at AHR, the AHR Expo that's going to be in Atlanta. Uh, talk a little bit about that and uh, you know, what you've got lined up and how people can participate. Okay, great. So we've got Lawrence in one of our sessions. Uh, basically, we're um, I flounder over and, and take a read at that. This is the part where Ken Russell's papers, but I don't have any papers, <laughs> so I'll have, to, uh, I'll have to digitally grab my words here. I hope they come up. So, so I think you're being digitally mindful here, Ken. You're doing a great example of, uh, you know, how being mindful in technology come in. Because me, 
and how they work hand in hand. Because for me, I would just uh, I just gloss over it. I wouldn't deal with the digital part of it at all. So I'm I'm impressed. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so what what we've got is this session called Smart Environments for Humans, and it says Ken and Lawrence are going to discuss to succeed at transform transformation. Instead of making humans more technical, we need to make technology more human. So welcome to Digital Mindfulness, unlocking the value and opportunities of time well spent digital experiences. Current smart environments operate on a machine level and do not understand people. The new paradigm, smart environments can operate on a human level. New technologies, innovation, AI, emotive computing, advances in scientific dis disciplines, neuroscience, psychology, will all be dem will demonstrate this to be possible. As you can see, I'm fumbling with the words, so I'm, I'm, I'm leaning heavily on Lawrence to, to make sense of all of that. Well, I tell you what, speaking of Lawrence, Lawrence is our guest this week. Uh, it looks like we got him teed up and ready to go. So Ken, how about introducing our guest this week? Great. Okay. Okay. First, I uh, first met Lawrence, and uh, he invited me to do an inventory, an inventory, an interview on his uh, uh, his podcast. And uh, he told me it was all about mindfulness, and I had to admit I was totally mindless. So I did an interview and answered his questions, but of course, not really answering his questions from the way he was asking, because I had no idea what it was he was doing. Uh, the good news is he lost that interview, and uh, it, uh, we actually did a retake uh, about a year later, and by then I had a little bit of an idea what he was doing. Uh, again, uh, when I went to Helsinki, Lawrence was there speaking to the crowd, so I actually got to meet him in person, and I was totally impressed, and I want to introduce him to the Control Trends uh, community, as well as the Automated Buildings community. Uh, so without further ado, do, here is Lawrence Amplo. Hey, hey, Lawrence, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me both. I really appreciate it. Oh, man, I have become a big fan. I'm a big podcast listener. So I've recently discovered through Ken your podcast, Digital Mindfulness. And, and I got to tell you, it, it, it is fantastic. I encourage our community. This is, this is a voice you want to have in your ear as we sort of navigate these waters of di digital mindfulness and discover opportunities. So, Lawrence, I'll start with uh, how did you come up with digital mindfulness and the podcast and the website? What got you into that? Um, so, um, it's kind of a long story, but I'll give you the truncated version. So, um, <clears throat> my, I really, so my career is, um, I'm a data scientist and also a political scientist. And my, my whole job really has been to encourage people to spend more time online and also optimize the time that they would spend online. Um, but I think just in conversation with a few of my colleagues, we started to really think about the question of, you know, what, where is the literature of basically people spending too much time? And this was just, this was when mobile had just started to take off. Um, so this was really about um, 2011, we started to think about this. And so being an academic myself, um, I tried to find some literature on this. I tried to find out, you know, who are the voices um, that are talking meaningfully about um, if there are any dangers of spending too much time online. And that really was the start of it all. It was a gripe that I had. Um, but then, so I found a few books, found Sherry Turkle's um, Alone Together, found Nicholas Carr's Atlantic Article, you know, the, which is The Shallows Now, um, and a few other books. But I thought that these books were great at setting up the problem that people are spending way more time with Google, we're outsourcing um, our, our memories, um, we're, we're outsourcing um, I don't know, our friendships, we don't even remember phone numbers anymore. Except I understand all of those problems, but I wanted solutions. Um, and so, again, I just started to do some more digging around this. And what I found was that people had solutions to these problems, but they were talking in different silos. So the UX people had really interesting results, but they were only talking to their communities. Um, the technology people, they had, you know, the engineers, they had their own solutions to this. The information overload community, they had their own solutions and they had their own lexicon as well. And so um, the whole, my web, the website, basically Digital Mindfulness, was 
designed to join up all of those discussions, initially about spending too much time online, but now it's evolved to how can we spend that time in digital environments well? What does that mean? And what I'm finding now in the kind of, I'm in my fourth year of having done this, is that um, what, what I'm asking for is not, um, it's not just a nice to have, and it's not just a simple, um, um, it's not just a soft thing. It's actually an economic imperative. And you're finding that now from moves by shareholders, from activist sites, from politicians, um, but from the big technology companies themselves, that they would call them digital well-being. But you're finding now that, for example, um, companies now have to really factor in what is that time well spent element to the time that people are going to be spending with my digital artifacts, whether that be an advert or in this case, stepping into a digitized building. How are people going to spend time well? Because then you go from then having a, um, a simple customer that would just be a one-time transaction to having um, a relationship, to having a partner, and that person will come back again and again and again. So Very cool. that's how I got to today. Well, I, I got, that's, I got a quick, a, that's a quick answer. You can imagine it. You, you, <laughs> yeah. you got the other one, the unabridged. <laughs> well, well, I, I, I want to ask, uh, because I've, I've been very interested in philosophy, and, and Zen is one of the, the philosophies I'm very interested in. So when you say mindfulness, that's a, you know, a Zen or digital, you know, a, a Zen term. And, you know, and for our community who might not know, um, and, and I think everybody knows throughout the beginning of time, having more stuff, and, and before the digital revolution, it could be more things, didn't necessarily lead to happiness. So, you know, the whole mindfulness thing is about being present in the moment and being mindful and sort of memorizing the distractions, if you will. So, uh, and, and I can see where this would maybe could apply to the digital world equally, if maybe even not more, Lawrence, because we, we got so much pulling us digitally. But, but the mindfulness part of it, did that come from that philosophy? It's a really good question. And it's something where um, I think perhaps from a, um, from a lexicon and branding perspective, people sometimes get a bit confused. But the term mindfulness, what it actually refers to is um, people um, focusing on the task mm. that it is that they're doing or focusing on the present moment um, without judgment. Yes. And, and when I, st and, you know, I'm very much a proponent um, of mindfulness practice and mindfulness meditation. But once I started to take that explanation and again, a very non-secular explanation, but then apply it to our digital world. I thought, what would my digital present moment look like? And that was in 2011. And it would have been incredibly noisy. So my phone would have been going. I would have had um, lots of browser windows open. My email notifications would have been um, interrupting me. And I thought that was a really good starting point to start to think more meaningfully about humanizing um, digital interactions or creating these time well spent experiences. Oh, very, 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 very well said. And I think it was episode three with uh, <laughs> Alex. Uh, I'm probably not pronounced his name right, but it was, it was kind of fascinating because you guys were talking about the sort of technology boom. And one of the things he pointed out was that uh, well, we've always been dealing with technology since the beginning of time, and uh, and a sort of a reassuring note that he had was well, well, you know, we evolved to it, right? Uh, that, you know, we, we tend to evolve to have the technology, but it seems like we're in a period of disruption, at least digitally. I look at my kids and I look at other people. I mean, my wife cannot do anything unless she's got the phone in front of her, or, you know, and this whole social networking and all. So, um, and, and, you know, and I think one of your other guests was talking about, you know, for our community, to give you an example, uh, you know, there's a big, big thing now to designing attention uh attention managing devices right so so i think this is you know again sort of calling out where the opportunities might be for our community but speak to both those if you would it's um it's a really interesting point and um i do remember that conversation that was years ago but that was your third about, episode dude <laughs> that was right that was years ago but talking with alex um um about um and he believes that you know um that basically people co-evolve with with machines and this is something that Jeff, Jeff Bezos was talking about in 2007, I believe, but that, you know, we create our machines and then our machines create us. It's that nice. constant co-evolution. Um, but what with, I think um, it's a really interesting point, um, but I think it's, it takes away a lot of agency 
that we have and it really leaves us um, a slave to um, to bad design to bad experiences mm. um, that you know um, I remember Facebook um, and this was a gosh this was years ago and they really have turned a corner just a quick caveat they really do an excellent work in this space now in terms of time well spent but I do remember lots of press releases basically come in that um, the agents that basically people should regulate their own behavior on Facebook and people should regulate their own time that they're spending there that actually Facebook's just a tool and nothing more when um, of course um, that couldn't be further from the truth and so um, and so what we're actually finding now is that um, because the technology landscape is changing and actually this harkens back to a paper in 1995 <clears throat> 95 from um, Mark Weiser the late Mark Weiser and um, he wrote um, a really influential paper, happy to send it and share it with you, it's fantastic. Perfect. And one of the things that he wrote, basically this was the start of thinking of um, um, ambient computing. And he was part of um, the Xerox Research Park community. And basically what he said was that um, technology should impact attention the least amount po possible. That actually technology should be in the background and mm. support um, human flourishing, human development, whatever that may mean in a given environment. So um, again, you know, we're talk if we talk, if we speak about buildings, um, there are so many elements of human flourishing that technology definitely can support, but at the moment it doesn't because it's not, um, it's not sensitive to um, to what people want to do. Rather, people have to, as Ken mentioned at the beginning, people have to wrap themselves around the needs of the technology. So if your phone goes, you have to answer it. And it's very difficult to know whether um, it's spam you're receiving or something very important. Mm. Um, it's difficult, again, as Ken mentioned, with like say the air conditioning to just walk in and, and understand like, oh, is this, um, um, is this do, I, do I require this? Is, this? is this good for me or not? Even for example, when you ring up um, and have customer service, it's very common that um, the the, um, the bot at the end of the line or the automated teller at the end of the line won't know how you feel. So it won't know if you feel frustrated, it won't know if you're anxious and it can't respond accordingly. But the technology exists, for example, emotion analytics. Um, these exist and they're um, perhaps whilst not um, completely sophisticated just yet, um, I think we're starting to think more creatively about how we can, I guess, add value to the digital experiences that we have. And that means um, it's almost like, um, again, customer first, you know, it's people first um, design or thinking. And, um, and it's creating this incredible ecosystem of um, thought, but also startups. Nice, nice. Ken Sinclair, um, you know, coming from the building automation side, working with Johnson Controls and, and sort of watching the trend from the building perspective, the control side, what's the gap here and how do we close it? I think it's a it's a pretty big gap, uh, and certainly, uh, I was pleased when I found uh, the teachings of uh, Dr. Lawrence. Uh, it's uh, it's very important. I think that our industry tap into this. Our last issue, the uh, Building Whisper, uh, I started to define that that these are the people who have empathy for what's going on in the building and they basically he uh, uh, can bring out the humanistic uh, relationship and I think that's something we have to work on. Uh, the common theme is of course is that we have to keep all of this technology in the back. It was kind of interesting again I, as usual when I start writing an article I have no idea what it's about until I finish reading it at the end and uh, what happened here is uh, even when the people started reading it, they put more emphasis on some pieces than I did, and the voice leapt out. And one of the reasons the voice as an interface leapt out was because it uh, doesn't require a device. So this is a, this, this helps us, I, I think, with mindfulness in the fact that anytime we touch a physical device or look at a physical screen, we our attention is controlled. So any kind of uh, interaction that we can happen that does not uh, does not command our attention. And so voice is a typical thing that we're used to talking to people as we walk through our life. Uh, 
asking them to help us open the door, close the door, um, you know, what, whatever we, we do, we're used to that interface. So where I see this kind of going, uh, we had some really good uh, input from uh, Unified Box out of Singapore. They're doing a lot of work in this area and they're starting to put a lot of voice commands to actually do physical things, open the blind, close the window, those, those kinds of things. But, but what's happening is what I think Lawrence is talking about is needs to also transform over into the machines. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking at this time that uh, next month's issue is going to be mindful machines. And I think that's where we're evolving. So, uh, but I'm still trying to catch up on what Lawrence is really saying. Every time he says something, it's, it's another idea for me. Well, it is. And, and we're going to, I want to eventually cycle around to the business case for this, because at the end of the day, it's the money that drives everything. But you know, Lawrence, and again, on another one of your podcasts, I listened to, there was a concept called first in mind. And I guess uh, my question would be, what's the difference between first in mind and mindfulness? Um, Yes, it, it's, um, it's really interesting with, with regards to first in mind. Um, so first in mind, what it really refers to, and there are lots of people that are working on the, um, on the issue of attention, particularly in the workplace and in um, the education place, so university, schools, etc. But it really relates to where our information, so where our attention um, is being directed at any one time. Um, and then with regards to um, first in mind is then what, influences or what um, different inputs might um, might shape that in that um, um, that attention so that something else then comes first in mind it's a really interesting point because um, because essentially we are in an attention economy Um, our attention is monetized and um, and whenever we do enter into a digitized environment um, that is essentially um, the main um, 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 the main thing that's being monetized with regards to mindfulness now um, and again the, the kind of the aspects where I'm working from I'm really interested in okay <clears throat> that's fine we've got all of these machines that don't understand me all they understand are um, um, for example just pumping out notifications or sounds or noises they're interested in um, in finishing up that if this then that loop right so Mm. kind of finishing off that loop but then what if technology could be designed better what if our advertising what if our buildings what if our social what if our social networking experiences or even um um our search experiences what if they could be designed so that they were available and they delivered kind of what I wanted when I wanted them or what I needed and when I needed them. So I think the example of um, customer service is really apt. Um, What if when I was calling to complain about something that that a machine could understand not only how I felt, but could understand how to diffuse me, Mm -hmm. how how to diffuse that negative um, experience. And so it's really interesting, Ken was talking about voice because what we're seeing now is we're moving from simple commands which actually when you're in an environment with people yelling at an alexa is um it's not great most of the time you know you have to shout above the noise so it can hear you so everyone just stops and then has to go back um but um, what you're finding now and um, particularly i just saw the microsoft um product roadmap it's really fascinating and you're moving now towards conversational ai basically so so um AI is able to understand um, different brands, the voice of the brand, so how it should be talking to its target customer. And it's able to understand the emotions behind the person speaking to it. And so you're going to be able then to have conversations that don't necessarily take away from the ambience in a room or in an environment. Um, And that's just one example. But um, I think this is where we're going, kind of almost bringing together um, that, human attention with that mindfulness those mindfulness properties understanding where people are and then wrapping machines around that rather than the other way around that's that's a great response uh and actually which uh, kenny kenny smyers is here because of course he in his last podcast he he discovered uh, uh in voice and was so excited about where that potentially could lead us 
Uh, another just add on to what you added there was uh, we now have the technology to create voice prints. Uh, mm -hmm. Last time my last time my uh, credit card got uh, compromised, I was chatting with them, and when I finished, they asked if they could take a voice print. And they, I said, what's that all about? And he says, well, you just all we want to do is we've recorded your voice, and we have a file, <clears throat> and we, when you call back next time, we'll compare your voice to that file. It is not. Uh, is not the only way that they will validate me, but it at least indicates a trend of who I am. Uh, certainly, male, female, uh, you know those kinds of things. So yes, uh, this voice is is an interesting adjunct, and I think it'll get us quicker to uh, mindful relationships than than some of our touch screens, phones, things we have to physically. Uh, Act from. The other one that, that came out of, uh, out of Helsinki when you and I were both there was uh, the, the advantages of a deviceless uh, environment. Uh, I thought that was, I took that away from Helsinki and it built on it. Well, you know, Ken, when you came back with the voice thing, I immediately went out and got some Alexas. Uh, Lawrence, I have a five-year-old and a three-year-old at home, and it took them all of uh, two nanoseconds to pick up on it. And uh, so they, they interact with Alexa every day. Now, they, they're sort of learning some bad manners because they don't say please and thank you. So that would be the one advice I give uh, to the voice recognition. If they're small children, they have to say please and thank you. Or Alexa says you have to say please. <laughs> but, uh, but, 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 but at the rate they do, and then let's get back to this whole evolution thing. Because, you know, there's really not much of a need for my children, especially with Alexa, to need to know how to spell, how to write, how to add. Uh, how to do research because they can just ask. So is there a danger uh, that, 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 you know, the next generations are not going to have, I mean, right, uh, you know, the basic knowledge is that we do. And is, is that a potential bad thing or is it a good thing? Or maybe it's not good or bad. It's not the right question. It's, um, it's, a, really interest, it's a really interesting point. I think, um, I mean, it's, it's a huge, huge question, first of all, um, that we might, you know, I think as, between the three of us, we might scratch the surface, but, um, so it's very much a kind of fireside and glass of wine chat. But, so, but it's, I think what it kind of alludes to a larger question of what skills um, or jobs might machines displace from humans. And, you know, again, is that a bad or a good thing? Or what are we going to need to do um, to get rid of some of the negative um, impacts of that? One of the really fantastic things that I'm seeing um, whenever I talk to enterprises and whenever I talk to thought leaders about this, um, we have had the discussions about um, universal basic credit, or universal basic income. Um, we have had the discussions that actually, for all of our discussions about AI and ML, that actually those technologies are not sophisticated enough yet um, to displace human beings. Or we've even had like the third type where you have authors like um, um, the MIT professors, Brynjolfsson and McAfee, they say that actually what you need are, you know, don't discount the jobs where, human, where machines can't compete with human beings, things, like, things that require a lot of empathy, like caring and nursing, etc. cetera. Um, I think from the discussions I've been having, I think the discussion has moved on a bit more and it is fascinating. So I think that there's going to be, I think the, the market now for having, for two things, having um, people interact properly with these machines is going to be enormous. So people that can basically be the filter between the machines and people um, is going to be great indeed. So they probably won't come oh, again uh, you know we're probably not at the stage yet where a bot can take over completely the role of say customer service there's always going to have to be a person involved in that but knowing that point at which a person has to be involved again um, having the machine interact properly with the customer and also with the human agent um, this is a really really important job and we're seeing this across the entire technology stack across the across the enterprise people I'm finding that leaders are less interested in getting rid of the workforce as they are in having the workforce properly interact with the tools so that they can get the best out of both worlds, basically. And I think that that's really fascinating. So 
the skills that we're going to need, certainly in terms of empathy, courtesy, literacy, etc. You're absolutely right. Those are core skills that we definitely can't lose. Digital literacy um, is going to be a critical skill. So your children, for example, are going to have to know that um, whatever they write and share online stays forever. Yeah. So they're going to have to comport themselves accordingly, right? Um, which is very different to when us when we were growing up. You know, we could say things, we could do things, and they would Forgotten. certainly wouldn't be there yeah. forever, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, the, the other thing I just want to add right at this point, though, is you're defining a whole new uh, breed of person, and for lack of a better description, I want to call them a bot whisperer. And uh, so we basically all have to need, we all need to turn into bot whisperers because we need to <laughs> nice. do that interface in between. We, it's, uh, so we're not talking to a horse, we're talking to a bot and we're talking to people and somehow we have to kind of create a meaningful relationship between those two things. And I think that's why we're having this discussion on control trends is all these folks that are watching it that have uh, been deep in technology uh, like I have, we need to discover you because we need to understand that we have to change our thoughts and we have to be more empathetic. We need to be mindful uh, and practice mindfulness. Well, and, and I think that the fact of the matter is the genie's out of the bottle. The technology's not going to go away. So I'm going to ask my control trends community and Lawrence, you and Ken to indulge me for a minute. I want to wax philosophical here for a minute, right? Because, you know, if you look at what's going on with technology, one definition of technology is you create a machine or whatever that can do the task it took 10 or 15 people to do now, a machine and one person can do it. So I think the other trend that I'm seeing, and again, I'm, I'm getting out there here, okay? So is it for the first time in history, we've got more supply and have the ability to create more supply of everything with technology than we ever had. So the one thing that might be uh, uh, in jeopardy is, Jobs might be reduced. So, and, and I think, but, but with the, the supply and everything else, I think we're going to get to the point where there's no reason for anybody on the planet to be hungry, thirsty, or anything else, right? I mean, I think the, 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 the way we do economics right now is probably standing in the way. But here's the question from a philosophical standpoint. I had a teacher once tell me, if you really want to piss somebody off, solve all their problems for them. <laughs> and I said, well, what do you mean? He goes, well, people define themselves by their problems. Well, I think people also, I mean, I think one of the basic human needs is the struggle for significance, right? And people have significance by having challenging jobs. So if this technology, which I have no doubt is going to happen, is going to continue to evolve in such a way that everything gets easier and easier and easier to the point that you could probably not have anything consequential you need to be willing to do other than to be nice to people i'm wondering about the psychological effect it's going to have down the line i think that's it. i i 100 agree with you and there are a few podcasts i've got on my show where we do talk about this very thing um and i think the idea from this is that um what you're finding now is that there's a growing discussion in the design community specifically about designing in friction so the whole technology, the way we design our digital experiences is to remove as much friction as possible so that our journeys are seamless, right? So you kind of glide through Amazon. And, but what you're finding is that that rhetoric is useful only insofar as we're going, only insofar as we have interactions with, sorry, um, um, interactions, transactions with things. So if I'm shopping for something or if I'm, say, um, voting, online i don't want any friction i just want to be able to make my choice and then kind of go out and that's fine but if i'm interacting with people and we use the example of airbnb um having more friction or more contact with other people is perhaps more conducive to empathy human relationships communication as well because then my grammar has to be good and you know and congeniality you know all of these again what we might say scott soft skills but are critical for a function in a well-functioning society the airbnb example is really useful because they were focused initially on having the whole experience be as seamless as possible for the guest and for the host but what they found was that um, um by measures of time well spent from both the guest and the host when there was greater friction so when the host and the guests were kind of move to ask more questions or to interact with each other more on the journey 
then the relationship was strengthened and both parties ended up having a much better experience. So the trust factor was increased. All of these things which lead to a strengthening of the platform as a whole. Very well said. I think there's another concern, this whole, uh, this digital idea that the robots and bots will take over from us is, is so far from the truth. It's the, the, uh, the arena that is developing is the bridge between, and that's what we all have to get involved in. And, and that's, that's why we're having these kind of discussions, because this is not a bridge technologists have been in, but we need to be in because we, we, we know how these technologies work. We know how we can make them invisible. We don't really understand people, but nobody really does. But there's some people that'll help us know, know more. And again, let's do it like we do everything jump off the cliff and figure out how to fly before we hit bottom. Well, well you know, but Ken, and again, we're having, this is a great conversation. I, I love these kinds of conversations, but I think we got to get to the, so now you, you, you run CB Richard Dallas or you run one of these big real estate firms and now, um, or you're a consulting engineer because Lawrence keeps bringing up the term design. I mean, what's, what's the business case? I mean, I've got a couple of reasons to argue business case, but Ken, I'd like to hear from you and Lawrence. I'd like to hear from you. What's the business case? I own some buildings why would I invest in this or why would I challenge my consulting engineer or my systems integrator to, and, and how would that look? Go ahead. <laughs> okay. yeah. yeah. Ken just handed the ball to you, Lawrence. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to know Lawrence. I've got my own ideas, but I want to hear yours first. Yeah, sure. Better. Sure. Um, so, so I think building out the business case for this, This is something I've really been focused on for like the past, I think this calendar year, I've really been focused on it because you're absolutely right, Eric. It's it's nice being able to philosophize about all of this, but actually you need to bring it down to the real world and say, how is this really going to help business? How is this going to incentivize business so that we can, again, have people? Because it can't just be that all of these um, negative attention hijacking experiences are the only things that create economic value, can't be. So um, one of the things that you're actually finding um, in, terms of, um, in terms of the business case for this, and I'm gonna use the, the case of Google, Google Play, because they're a huge company and, and they support lots of small businesses, so this might actually help you. Um, what they were finding is that um, you might think that, for example, Google's a data company, so, and they're an online advertising company. So by capturing people's attention in any way possible, that this would be the, um, the reason for being for Google. And so to have all of the different products, et cetera, have do this would be the most optimal way of increasing revenue. What you're actually finding though, is that when people, people realize now when, they're hi- when their attention is being hijacked and people realize um, more, they realize much more acutely when they have a negative experience, they know when their time is not well spent, when they're just scrolling through Facebook or scrolling through Instagram. Um, with the building, with um, buildings, digitized buildings, people realize when they don't have a good experience there, a good digitized experience. And so what you're finding is that when people have negative experiences, they leave that app. So the app usage decreases sharply over time if they have a negative experience or in terms of an um, ad experience, people will skip ads or leave that platform. So, um, so basically, if people have a negative experience, then you lose subscribers, you lose customers, you lose users. It's just, it's, it's the worst experience possible. So then by incentivizing, um, by incentivizing designers or incentivizing engineers to really understand what is a time well spent experience for your consumer, at your, um, in your particular industry. And the ways that people are doing this are by um, data. So by using, um, for example, um, in this case of Google, the app usage data, um, social media data, the way people are responding and behaving and talking about their different experiences, you can actually, you can actively create um, these time well spent experiences so that people, when they have a meaningful, humanized experience within an app they will use the application more people will be less likely to migrate to ios where the environment is much more closed and so it's more you know the 
the time it takes to develop these experiences on iOS is longer because it's got to go through a longer approval process. And then people will more will stay with Google within their ecosystem. So it was a really interesting discussion that I've been having with the teams there because it's almost like this virtuous loop that if we can incent if we incentivize designers and I don't know, um, um, ad creators more to really fervently understand users, understand what time well spent is, then it creates a better ecosystem. We make more money, developers make more money, users have a better experience. And, you're, and you have significance yeah. in your life again. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad I tossed it over to you to start with because that's, that's a great introduction. And actually what my question to you is going to be, is in our industry, the, the adage is, is if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And I was trying to think in my mind as we were talking, how do we quantify, qualify mindfulness? And in your discussion there, you basically gave the answer is the success of our bots and in our devices and the, and the rating of friction created or not created will be the rating of our success of the implementation of mindfulness. Does that sort of make sense? It, it absolutely does. And um, I think what's interesting now, we're at a point in this very moment, much more so than when, um, when we all started talking about this years ago, that we're able to just gather much more, uh, many more data points um, about people so that we can kind of get to that almost that single point of truth where we do understand um, how people are um, from an attentional perspective, from a cognitive load perspective, from an emotion perspective, all of these different data points so that we can deliver these time well spent experiences um, more regularly. You got to figure business owners is competitive like everything else, right? I mean, you know, they got competition. I think as people work more from home, uh, you're going to have to create an experience. The time well spent, which I love that. I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to nail that down to call it a great experience, okay? And I'm going to go as far out on a limb as to say that uh, I'm wondering culturally, both given the millennials and just, you know, the fact, I, I think maybe we put like a Maslow's hierarchy thing, right? And for our listeners who may or may not know this, some of you know, you learned in grand, you know, in high school or whatever that, you know, you basically start with the basic human needs. You know, people got to eat, they got to, you know, be, you know, be protected. And once they get that, then they can go to the next thing on the hierarchy, which maybe is learning. But then I think the highest one we've gotten so far, at least that I'm aware of, is self-actualization, which I'm improving myself. And I'm wondering whether we're in the spot where it's going to be the time well spent or the time well actualized is going to be the next level up on the, the hierarchy. And if so, if you're not delivering that experience to your tenants, they're not going to want to lease your space. Thoughts on that comment? I, I, I absolutely think so. Or rather, I think that people will just naturally gravitate towards the places that they have better experiences in, you know, to those, to those environments that are more intuitive to their needs or that foster, for example, um, more pleasant um, accidental collisions with the people that they, that they should be communicating with or whatever. Um, I think you're right with the business case. It's just fascinating. So, Obviously, there's the moral case that it's not that it's wrong to insert things like dark patterns or to hijack people's attention, etc. But also you're having it from a top down perspective. So, um, again, the big tech platforms are really starting to um, mandate like Facebook, for example, where they prioritize connections between friends and family over those with publishers. Um, they're really starting to crack down now on publishers and say you have to deliver experiences that people um the same types of experiences that people would have with their friends and family because that's why people come to facebook or that's why people come to google to search for things that they need in their lives and i really started to think about this with a few of my friends who are economists or data scientists etc and what we did what we came up with is that and here's i think the real business case i think the business case is attention so once people have that self-actualized experience um people again in the literature it's really likened to flow that flow state mm -hmm. by um, chick sent me high and what flow is is that inc incredibly heightened state of attention where um, um where everything else falls away 
and you're only focused on that thing that you're trying to do. So whether that is running, whether that's writing, whether that's coding, whatever that is. Um, and I think that once you have a person who's actually, imagine that, imagine having an actualized experience in Facebook, well then that makes you a prime advertising candidate. Or if you're in a WeWork building and you're having these incredible time well spent experiences there, then you'd never leave WeWork. You're right. the perfect customer. And I think that's the difference between having a casual user and, and a, a, a relationship, having a relationship with that person or a casual customer or a partner saying, I use WeWork, or I'm going to that building or I use Facebook because it supports me in connecting meaningfully with the people I want to connect with. So I really think it's, and if you have those kinds of people there, having those experiences from an advertiser perspective um, or from um, a revenue generation perspective, these types of people, uh, this is the holy grail, <laughs> essentially, of customer relations. Well, well, well I, th I think it is. And of course, with social media, and Ken, this gets to your point earlier, with social media, I mean, if they're having a bad experience, the world knows about it. I mean, instantaneously. So, you know, when it comes time to renew your lease, I mean, if, if you're a, a savvy leaser for your employers, you're paying attention to that feedback. And Ken, let's, let's talk about some of the variables that we can control. I mean, one of them, it goes back to even when you and I first got started in the business, which is going to have the temperature right to have a great experience. But, but Ken, in your experience, what are some other variables that you're seeing that, that our, our listeners can, uh, can, can hone in on to, 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 to create this effect? Okay, just before I go into that, I want to just also address the business case. One of the, the evolving business cases is the attraction of talent. And I think uh, you and I talked about that as, uh, in, in our uh, discussion on digital mindfulness. But this is becoming very important is there's, for the really good people, uh, they want to come into an environment like this that has all of these uh, mindfulness they don't want to have a lot of friction they don't want they want to be attracted to it and uh, I think uh, we just had this post from uh, WeWork uh, of our good friend Lindsay uh, Baker who is uh, from Comfy and uh, has gone on to WeWork and is uh, head of sustainability and well-being even the title uh, uh, suggests a whole new thing and I think if you read through that there's all these good words, and but if you understand, I think the reason why that was put there, the main reason and all the effort that we work is putting into that is to attract better talent, more talent, uh, and that is probably a bigger business case than anything. So what's happening with us as an industry, we're moving into realms where we've never provided value before, and I think that's, that's complex for us because... Uh, we're technologists. We, you know, we install this stuff and make the temperature go up and down, and right. uh, that's what we do. But we never, we've never kind of got into this human side of it. We we've, we've seen the curves, and we know that that's the big number in the buildings. But we're getting closer to having a reaction on that. Well, I think we are in, in large. One thing that's really encouraging in our industry, the real estate people came up with this met, met, metric, which is the, they call it the three thirty three hundred dollar rule, which basically they're basically they're, they came up with it for every square foot they build, they're spending rough stuff in it and three hundred dollars for the employees that are in there. So affecting their productivity is, you know, the savvy real estate people are now sort of tuned into that, which is, I think, gets right into your time well spent. Uh, because that has got to have a profound effect on productivity. And, and I think for our, our community, the, the people that listen to us, the systems integrators, the consulting engineers, and all, I, I think Lawrence and Ken are providing us with a vocabulary where you can have a differentiating conversation with your customer. Because if you are able to lay it out like this and, and state the business case in these terms and the time well spent, you're going to have a distinct advantage over your competitors. And, and I think, Ken, it comes back to some of the stuff that's coming into our industry, the, the, the building analytics, you know, the integration of lights and, and uh, the temperature. I mean, the term well-being, Lawrence, is coming into our building. Now, some people are, we've got the first well building. It has, everything's controlled, the, the air quality is perfect, all the snacks are healthy, things like that, which I think fall right into what you're talking about. Well, the other thing I'd like to point out is we've got this great opportunity coming up in January uh, in Atlanta, 
when Lawrence is coming and we've got a whole session that he's going to be available, you'll be able to come up and touch his magic ring. Right? <laughs> nice. nice. <laughs> and, and become mindful. And uh, I think uh, it's, it's an experience you want to be part of. Uh, I very much enjoyed his presentation in Helsinki. He's promised to, uh, uh, to give us pretty much that. I promise that I will interrupt them several times to uh, to get discussions like we've just been having here because that's I found them more intriguing. I found his his presentations is amazing. You need to go through it to kind of get the sense of what he's about. But then, as soon as you understand it, then you've got a bunch of questions, and he best answers those questions just as he has on this podcast. Whoops, I guess it's video. <laughs> well, I am podcast. We do both. Yeah. So good stuff. So Lawrence, if you're going to be in Atlanta, we, I'd like to extend an invitation to you that Sunday night before we have something called the Control Trends Awards, which uh, all the major players in our industry will be there. It's a good time. We come together, we celebrate, we, we eat, drink, we be merry. And then Ken Sinclair usually puts somebody in the Hall of Fame. So if you're available, we'd love to have you as our guest uh, at, at the Control Trends. Award. Oh, thank you. I'd love to come. Awesome, I'll, awesome. I'll, if you've, if you've got nobody, nobody better to sit with, you can sit with me and I'll try and introduce right, you to a right. few folks in the you industry. Said, you sitting with me. What are you talking about? I'm not <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Yeah, so Lawrence, it, it, this is, uh, it's so great to talk to you because I, I think that, you know, things start with theory. They start with research. They start with theory. You come up with a premise and then, and then you sort of course adjust. But, but I think, uh, I see a huge future in, in our industry, sort of understanding your concepts and, and creating, create, creating this great experience. I, I think there's, so um, I'm, I'm really, really lucky. Like I, I kind of started this um, a little while ago and there have been people who've been thinking, you know, I'm really standing on the shoulders of giants. There are people who've been thinking about this since the eighties, since we've had computers, um, um, certainly personal computers. But I think that, the the scope of this of its application is so huge and you know i can you know i think this might be a little bit hyperbolic but um but really we're really thinking about changing um design frameworks changing um business models as well it's almost like a new level of um, value creation here and the great thing is that it really integrates both pe people and the tools that we create as well uh, it's just so, such a timely conversation and, and i love looking out in the future now rumor has it that you spent some time in buenos aires <laughs> is that true um, i did yeah I, I i lived there i lived there for a little um, while yeah did you dance in the argentine tango <laughs> no um 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 my dancing abilities uh Strictly English. Well, 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 oh no! <laughs> well, well, oh, no. Listen, my, 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 mine are suspect at best, but I know you and I have the same haircut, those perfect heads. So I, I got to tell a quick story here. I was uh, dancing Argentine tango in 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 Atlanta, and uh, you know, it, it, Argentine tango is kind of a, a very controversial dance because the man or the leader typically stands very, very straight, and the reason being because he has a uh, they used to have a dagger in their back, right? And so uh, it would either lead and, you know, the, the dancers would either lead, lead, wind up with bloodshed or sex. There wasn't mm -hmm. much in between. And it was actually outlawed for many years. But uh, so I studied uh, in Atlanta and, and was going to Buenos Aires for uh, uh, the International Argentine Tango Festival. And uh, the dance is full of nuance. And, and we were schooled religiously. You do this, you don't do this. And one of the things is you don't ask somebody to dance. You sort of look across the room at them. If they look at you and then blink twice, you know, you can go ask them. If they blink three times, you better start running because their boyfriend's getting ready to kill you. So it's like all these rules. So we, we arrive in Buenos Aires. We go to the first Malanga, which is the big dance, right? And uh, the place is packed, right? And uh, you can hardly move. And uh, I kind of, you know, some of my courage, and I look over at this beautiful Argentinian woman and, she gives me the right cue. I wind up dancing with her. And the dance floor was literally so crowded, guys. That, I mean, we moved maybe four steps the whole time. But she was so present and was such a beautiful dance. It was just the most incredible experience. I mean, it was pure, pure art, pure magic, pure poetry. But I do my three dances with her because you, know, you do three dances at a time. Go back and sit down. And after I can, my heart stops beating fast, I go over to the bar to get a beer. And I said, I'm going to try this again. 
And so I'm looking out across the thing and I, I see this girl and I sort of give her the eye and she looks at me kind of funny. And then I kind of look away. I look at her again. She gives me the eye. And next thing I know, she's up walking towards me. And I've not prepared for this, but I figure this is very bad news because everything's supposed to be very subtle. And she walked up and she says, excuse me, you're trying to ask me to dance. I said, yeah. Said, I couldn't tell because the light was bouncing off your head in the reflection. I couldn't, couldn't make out. <laughs> so I'm, I love Buenos Aires. Was it a good experience for you living there, Lawrence? Oh, my gosh. Um, life-changing experience living there. Absolutely incredible place. How, how many years were you down there? Um, it was just under a year. But, um, but yeah, but the whole experience has shaped wow. everything I do now. So, yeah, I'm, oh, very yeah cool. absolutely fascinating place. Well, you and I will have to do a, uh, another podcast and we'll talk about uh, yeah. you know, tango steaks in Argentina or something. I, <laughs> How's, um, sorry, I've just, this might be a cue point, but I was just wondering, what's the um, um, automated buildings industry like, say, in Latin America or the Spanish-speaking world? It's fragmented, very fragmented. It's, it's like the country. It's, um, right. I, I, too, have been to Buenos, but... Uh, didn't dance and uh, just as a tourist, but it, it's an, an exciting, interesting place. But uh, we actually have ones and twosies, readers and stuff uh, from almost all of the South American uh, countries. Uh, they're starved for information, starved for products, uh, starved for concepts. That being said, uh, there's, there's uh, San, uh, Sao Paulo is starting to uh, generate a bit of a, okay. a tech bunch and uh, uh, haven't seen too much from Boynus. Uh, there doesn't seem to be too much of a technology thing, but it's, it's just early days for them. And, and it's at the, from, from our, our look at the industry, it's, it's fairly fragmented. Yeah. Europe's different though. Europe and Asia are completely different. Uh, a company of one of the major players in our industry now, a newer player actually is a company called easy IO and they have a global conference every year and, like Madrid, Paris, or whatever, and uh, and it's fascinating. Can I mean you? You ought to come to that. Both you guys ought to come to that. I think they're doing it in Italy next year. So, uh, but amazing. what's amazed me about that is how the integrators from around the world, with the exception of Latin America, although Mexico is playing pretty hot and heavy. Now. Yep, yeah, Mexico's uh, strong. Yeah, but, but how much we have in common and the nuances from the individual countries. So it's, it's yeah. Really There's actually an AHR show in in Mexico. Uh, don't have the date right off the top of my head, but it's every year they have, uh, they, they run a, a Mexico show as well as a yeah. North American show. Okay, so uh, I got another question for you guys. So let's imagine it's um, five years from now, we're, we're, we're doing our fifth pa- podcast together. Ken, uh, everything has gone in the automated buildings world the way you predicted and expected. So walk our audience through how uh, an, a, a building is going to look five years from now in terms of controls and interfaces? And I'll ask you the same question in a minute, Lawrence. But given that Ken's the old goat that built the, the chiller. chiller. Yeah. God, I'm not even sure going to be here in five years. <laughs> but anyway, no, I don't know. I think, you better uh, be. I think the, pattern, the patterns have been set for sure. Actually, you, you mentioned when you introduced me the Johnson controls. When I left Johnson, it was uh, – was, Almost, almost pneumatic times, uh, uh, T six thousands and JC eighties. So it was uh, pretty, pretty crude technologies back in those days. Uh, the future, it's it's definitely going to move towards the devices not being obvious. Uh, and what I think that's why we're having this discussion is we've got to create a relationship with machines that is invisible. And they have to be mindful. They have to, they have to react to us. And this is going to develop faster than any of us can imagine because of the, the bot technology. Because we've crossed the floor and we're no longer in isolation as we all have been all of our lives. We've been a, a specialized industry. We are no longer a specialized industry. We're now part of the IoT industry. And whatever they do, we're going to be part of it. And so, therefore, we have to understand you know, why Lawrence is working for Google and why Google is interested in working with Lawrence. Those kinds of things we need to understand. We need to start putting this stuff into our products. Voice is not going to be the only interface. Video analytics, we, we didn't touch on that. We could do another session completely on that. 
the information that we can extract from video with AI, that's going to roll out. Um, and in the mechanical room, there will be pneumatic actuators still moving the dampers and, uh, and electric switches turning stuff on and off. Uh, probably that part is not going to change that much. So for all the people in the industry that think they're going to be replaced uh, by a robot that's going to go out and do that stuff, uh, think again. You're still going to have to make it work. And the only other thing is because you're part of the building of motion, when it doesn't work, the building are going to have an emotional hissy fit and they're going to come and find you and drag you out there to fix this stuff. So, uh, nice. So Lawrence, I, I, I'll rephrase the question a little bit for you. Let's imagine it's five years from now and, and just describe your ideal working space. You're, you're, you're working in a space and this, these are your requirements. Um, wow. So I think, um, I think in the next five years, um, in my working space, in the background, I'll be listening to news, and that news will be of um, a major company that's going through a lawsuit um, on one one element of their digital artifacts that has imp negatively impacted people's time or their attention, and that was done knowingly so. Nice. So one of the things that I talk about a lot is, um, I think there's going to be a need for what we, you know, in the same way that companies pivoted towards, or in, rather included, corporate social responsibility they realized their social footprint in the late 90s with you know no logo and globalization etc i think that now people are being aware of the attentional and health well-being um time impacts of our technologies and how these technologies they don't exist in a vacuum like we meaningfully create these things um i think that companies are going to be bought I think you're going to have digital responsibility offices, corporate digital responsibility offices that are going to be responsible for the quality of the artifacts that companies produce. And that's going to incorporate a skill set like law, psychology, ethics. It's going to incorporate all of that. They're going to have to know that. So that's what I'll be listening to in the background. Um, in terms of buildings, um, I think the buildings will be virtual as well as physical. So um, I think, um, I do think virtual reality is going to play a really yeah big part um in that in my building experience um, and particularly i think buildings are going to enable me to be closer to people um, and the people i need to be closer to with regards to my job or my personality type at a given point point of time that's something i'm really looking forward to as well because at the moment you know certainly big metropolitan cities there are millions of people there. Urbanization is increasing the pace, but every, you know, there are lots of people that are genuinely lonely. And I think buildings have a real opportunity to be differentiators in bringing the right people together. So what if we could be, you know, what if, I don't know, my phone or my device, whatever it is that I'm working, could direct me to the right person that would help me to have that wow. moment, that light bulb moment. Wow. Um, that, that that's something I'm thinking that that would be um, particularly useful, but um, but, but also, a, whole, yeah, so that's, a, whole, a whole new thing to synergy and 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 that I mean maybe just based on the data things, it's like uh, well, aren't you working on this problem? Here are three people we can direct you to that would have complementary exactly skill sets. Boy, talk about some productivity exactly. and, and, and not only that these people are you know in terms of personality type they yeah. most you know they most likely work well with you. Yes. Oh, that's that 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 that's that. Well, Actually, this is, oh, sorry. This is this is great though. The, the the big point you made that I completely missed is the virtual reality building. I love that, uh, and it's not so hard for us to imagine it as we're uh, sitting here in Atlanta, London, and uh, the west coast of Canada. Uh, we're talking, and we've actually have created a virtual building on our screen here, and we're starting to see the the start of that. We're also with, of course, uh, WeWork and uh, my daughter works for Shopify and uh, so she, her whole day is spent on Zoom and some, she has sometimes hundreds of windows open with a, a meeting kind of thing. So it's all kind of coming together uh, a lot quicker. Uh, that's an excellent point that I completely forgot and thank you for reminding me. Well, I have one of my I, you know, Ken Sinclair has always said you need to take a millennial to lunch. I have a millennial buddy and I, I got two really sources. I got one guy is the first guy I ever worked for. So he's in his seventies now and he's a voracious reader. And then I got my young friend, Anthony. So whatever they're reading, 
I call them once a month and I go read it or whatever they're watching. So I get a, a perspective, but Anthony is really big into virtual reality and his belief. He says the virtual reality people believe that it is literally going to be with the virtual reality. You're going to put the glasses on. That's going to be the platform. You never have to leave. You'll do everything from your virtual reality glasses, which seems a bit extreme, but, uh, but he says people are definitely talking about that and that they want to build that. That's what they want to build. So, so who knows? Actually, that's interesting. Uh, I just moved my virtual reality mask from the side of my chair up to my desk, which has all of my electronic uh, uh, things from the last 10, 15 years that uh, didn't work. I, it starts with an Atari, uh, so you can kind of understand how, how, how much my electronic museum is. I don't know if I can lift my laptop high enough so you can actually see it here behind me on my desk. But anyway, so all those devices back there are palm little palm things and all all those technologies that didn't work out virtual reality mask up so uh, i'm thinking the problem is is it's it's we we do not like devices we don't like headphones right. we don't like we don't like anything that touches us uh, we want to be free well, i've already signed uh, up for the chip they put in your brain that's how i'm going to interface with everything <laughs> it's make me a lot smarter lawrence how did tell 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 our community a little bit about your services that you provide and how people would engage you if they were interested so, um, so they've really, they've really evolved over time as well. And um, so, Eric, just to your very, to your last point, I just, I think um, the main, the last thing I wanted to say is that I think it's really important to ask, like, actually, are we going to be happier um, so in, you know, in this, you know, in these new digitized environments? So, you're right. There's going to be so much more stuff. Um, Ken, you were saying there's going to be. You know, we don't naturally want more devices. We don't want to buy more iPhones, but there's going to be more stuff. But I think really, are we going to be happier? Are we going to be spending our time well with each other? Are we going to be um, not, are we not going to, it's not that we're going to produce more, we're going to be more productive, but are we going to be like, is our productivity going to be better? You know, are we going to be able to connect with the right people, et cetera? And I think this is something right now we're uniquely able we're at a really good point to be able to solve these questions. And, um, and I think that's not probably not what a lot of companies are really thinking about now. I, I think, we... Yeah. I think that's brilliant, Lawrence. And if we don't build in happiness is uh, like, you know, I know I, I do a lot of sales and one of the questions I always ask is what has to happen for you to make a decision and feel really good about it? What has to happen for us to design this so that we're happier? If we don't put the happiness in the equation, it will get swept under the rug. Yeah, okay, my thought on this is that I, this is a philosophy of, of mine for the, the creation of Sinclair Energy Services, the creation of automated buildings. Basically, you want to live where you want to play. So you go where you want to play, then you create your life backwards from awesome. where you're happy, your happy place. So you're basically everywhere your happy place is, that's where I want to be when I get off this call. I'm going for a bike ride at two o'clock. Uh, <clears throat> this call, this call, m canceled my kayaking trip to an outer island because we didn't have enough time. So, there you are. You're cutting into my happiness, but you guys, you guys, you guys make me happy too. But okay. that is the situation. I think is that instant gratification that once we leave the virtual office, we are where we want to be, doing what it is we want to do, and I think that's how we're going to be happier. Uh, but I think we also find the challenge and the intrigue of being able to globally connect with people and have bigger ideas than we've ever had before. And then the first control vendor that comes out with a happy control, remember that Lawrence has that name trademark. So happy control, you're going to have to talk to him before you use it. But, but Lawrence, <laughs> again, tell, us, tell us how our community gets hold of you. I would encourage you to check out his website and his podcast. Oh, thanks very much, Eric. Um, so get in touch with me. Um, by email, um, it's hello at digitalmindfulness.net. Um, if you come to digitalmindfulness.net, the website, um, there's, there's loads and loads of resources and ways that we can connect. So there are events that we hold on this very topic, how we can create time well spent digital experiences. Um, but then also in terms of the other ways that I work with people, um, I also speak to um, companies as well. and who, you know, the people that basically create digitized or digital artifacts, how can we create these for time well spent? So really looking forward to hearing from you if you want to connect with me. Fantastic. Well, listen, Lars, hope we can get you back on the show again. That's it, folks. Another week on Control Talk. Now your smart building video cast and podcast. Special thanks to our guest, Ken Sinclair, automatedbuildings.com. 
the August issue is out. Check it out. And Lawrence, man, thank you so much. What a pleasure meeting. Appreciate you taking the time to uh, to touch in with us. As always, we appreciate our community. Remember, be bold, stay in control, stay relevant, and make sure you spend some time well spent this week. Be mindful. <laughs> thank you. Well done, guys. Lawrence, that was amazing. I loved it. Have a fun day.